good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. We've spent the first part of the spring walking through uh, selected psalms. We looked at uh, particular psalms in David's life. And, and the theme uh, of that section of psalms was finding God in the messiness of life. That life is filled with trials and temptation and confusion and circumstance that come our way. But God can be found and God is found in the midst of that messiness. Now we're going to spend the next five weeks and we're going to move towards Easter. Okay. And, and you, you, probably are aware of this, but the Psalms predicts the coming of Jesus more than any other book in the Old Testament. (laughs) There are promises that are woven through the Psalms, typically in in, uh, kind of like a a David typology form. And we're going to begin to look at some of those. And this morning, we're going to begin with Psalm 89, okay? Psalm 89 is a very important psalm. Uh, It actually is the closing of the third book of Psalm. You you may not be aware, but the the book of Psalms is 150 Psalms, but there's actually five books to it. And there is a rhythm, there is a a pacing and a teaching that goes through it. It can sometimes be a little difficult to follow, uh, so I'm going to help us a little bit. And so Psalm 89 comes at the conclusion of book three, and book three is entirely filled with laments, the sorrow, the suffering, the difficulty of life, and Psalm 89 is the conclusion of book three. We will see that the setting for Psalm 89 is a war-torn, very difficult Time. I'm going to build some of that context for us this morning. Psalm 74 and Psalm 76 have lamented the fall of Jerusalem and the fall of the temple. And now Psalm 89 will ask the very important question, where is the promised Davidic king? God, you had promises that David would always be on the throne. Where is that king? We will find this morning that Psalm 89 is bold And it's raw. It doesn't hide from the difficult questions of life that things do not look like we expected. Like you promised, God. I don't see it. It doesn't look right. So we're going to walk through Psalm 89. It's long, and so it's divided into three sections. And I will read it as we go and piece some things together. Now, this morning, I'm actually going to refer to some other sections of the Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 7 and Psalm 2 particularly. Those two sections of Scripture become very, very important for understanding these David typologies about the coming king, and I'm going to refer to them not only this week, but in the coming weeks, all right? So I'm going to move fast this morning. Don't get overwhelmed. You'll have a couple weeks where I'm going to continue to refer to these same scripture passages. You can study them during the week. 2 Samuel 7 and Psalm 2. Okay? So you guys pray with me, then we'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, we come to your word because we trust you. That you have revealed yourself. How awesome of a statement that is, that the God of the universe has revealed himself to us through your treasured word written over thousands of years. God, that from the foundation of the world, you predicted and anticipated your coming, the sending of your son, and you wove it intricately through the years, through many different authors, through many promises, God. Father, this morning... Would you allow us to see your faithfulness and to drink deeply of your promises and understanding that in our circumstance, in our lives, when we can't see straight, when we are so overwhelmed by our circumstances, that you are still faithful and that your promises are still true. We pray all of that. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Israel had become utterly sinful. They worshiped in big, showy ways through their festivals, but their hearts were far from God. You see, their real desire was to be just like their neighbors. They wanted to be just like everyone else. And they worshiped false idols, bowed down to them, even sacrificed their own children. Think about that. The God of Molech, that the Israelites were were sacrificing their own children. Their whole culture was full of corruption, bride, greed, sexual immorality. There was no justice for the poor, no compassion for the orphan or the widow. As a nation, they had become morally bankrupt and the Lord had warned them. He had sent prophet after prophet, famine after famine, foe after foe, but the people of God would not listen. They would not repent. And so finally, in 586 BC, God sent Babylon as his hand of judgment upon Israel to carry them to exile. Now imagine with me 20 years prior, and you're 10 years old, it's 606 BC, and Babylon has first come to siege Jerusalem. And they begin to rule over Judah. You may not understand what the word siege means. It's ancient warfare when the imposing army, because you would have a large wall that would protect a city, the army would come and would surround the city and not allow any outside resources to be able to come in. And they would just sit and wait, force you to come out and fight. Because if you didn't, you would starve to death. It would quickly become horrific. And Jerusalem caved. Judah caved. They had to. And so in 606, the first wave of deportations begins. And you at the age of 10, you see friends and families and neighbors carried off. Babylon would come in and pillage the land, take any resources that they wanted. Israel had become a vassal state. They they were forced to pay taxes to Babylon for 20 years, crippling their economy. Resources are now in very short supply because Babylon has taken everything. It's the difficulty of war and oppression. But the one thing you hold on to as an Israelite, is that God will not abandon us to our enemies. No matter how bad we become, you see, Babylon's way worse than us. And God has chosen Israel as his firstborn. He's promised in Genesis 49 and Numbers 24, 7, he's promised that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Psalm 2 says that the nations are in an uproar, that kings take their stand, but God has installed his king on Mount Zion, the Davidic king. You must remember 2 Samuel 7, when David tried to build God a house, but instead God said, I will build you a house, a dynasty. That, that David's promised throne would endure forever. That the Davidic king would be known as the son of God. Plus, Solomon built that temple. And the Shekinah glory of the Lord filled the temple God's presence here on earth was there in that temple, in that temple. How on earth could Jerusalem possibly fall if God's temple and God's presence were right there in Jerusalem? 
But you're now 30 years old, and it's 586 BC, and you've seen the unimaginable happen. Because after another one year siege, Jerusalem was utterly destroyed by the Babylonians. The wall crumbled to the ground, the whole city burned, houses, public buildings, and the temple. The temple of God burned to the ground. Hundreds of thousands starved, slain, burned, and anyone left was deported all the way to Babylon. The third deportation. Tens of thousands were chained and marched 900 miles for four months from Jerusalem all the way to Babylon. And King Zedidiah the last Davidic king attempted to escape but was captured, was brought back to Jerusalem where he would see his sons slaughtered right before his very eyes. And then his eyes were plucked out so that it is the last thing that he saw and he was taken to Babylon and he was put in a dungeon where he would spend the rest of his days. And now you sit in exile in Babylon. This is where the psalmist is when he writes Psalm 89. So let's turn to it. The psalm is divided into three major sections. And the first 18 verses, <clears throat> listen as the psalmist declares, what I want you to notice is that in the midst of this storm, he begins with praise to God. I'm going to read some assorted versions, uh, some assorted verses. I'll tell you, they'll also be on the screen, but you can follow along in your Bible. Verse one, I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever. To all generations, I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. Verse five, the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord. Your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. Verse 11. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that it contains. You have founded them. 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. 15. How blessed are the people who know the joyful sound, O Lord. <laughs> they walk in the light of your countenance. 18. For our shield belongs to the Lord and our king to the Holy One of Israel. Now remember the context in the situation that I just built up. Okay? And also remember, this psalm is about to get very dark. It's about to get very real and very raw. He's confused. He's angry. He's going to ask God, he's going to question God's timing. God, what's going on? Which is why it's so beautiful that the psalm begins with praise. Hear me, he leads his heart to worship. He remembers who God is regardless of his circumstances. Sounds like Psalm 103 verse 2. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits, right? He leads his soul in the midst of weariness, in the midst of dire situation. He leads his soul to worship God. Amen. And the same instruction is for us. Lead your heart to worship him. Fill up on who he is in the darkest night when you are confused, when you wonder if God is even near. Remember his character. Remember he has been faithful in the past and he will be again. Amen. 
I had a pastor friend text me this week who's going through a tremendous difficulty and trial in his own church, and he texted me, and he asked if I had any advice for him. My reply was this. Just remember that God is faithful. God is faithful, and he will be all the way to the end. You see, it's one thing to say, God, I love you, when you've just got a promotion at work and everyone is healthy. It's another thing to worship him in the storms of life. Lead your heart to worship. The second section of the psalm is verses 19 through 37. In this, the psalmist is remembering David's covenant. If you, if you read verses 19 and 20, he shifts, right? And he says he, he's remembering David. Right? Uh, once you spoke in a vision to your godly ones and said, I've given help to the one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him. So now he's looking at the promises given to David. Remember, that's 400 years prior. So he, he's, it's important because what he's going to do is highlight the promises that have been given to David and over a course of 400 years that have become important to the people of God. Now, before I read Psalm 89, it would do me some good to read for you some of these sections, okay? You can see it on the screen, but I'm gonna read for you 2 Samuel 14. Uh, sorry, 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 7 Verse 14, listen as I read this. This is, uh, again, when, when David asked to build the temple and instead God said, no, 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 I'm the one who gives promises. I'm the one who determines how this will go. And he gives promises to David. And listen to what he says in verse 14. He's talking about his son and that he will have a kingdom. And he says, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and with the strokes of the sons of men. Okay, God promising to the descendants, the heirs, the kings of David, I will be a son to him. And then also listen to Psalm 2, verses six through eight. Psalm 2, six through eight. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. Now that you've heard both of those promises, listen to how the psalmist writes in 89. Because he's 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 begun with praise, now he's shifted to the line of David and he is repeating the promises of God back to God. And he's saying, God, you said this. I have also set his hand on the sea, on a right hand, on the rivers. He will cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I shall also make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. You see, the psalmist is just repeating 2 Samuel 7, 14 and Psalm 2. He's repeating the promises of God. Now listen to 2 Samuel 15 and 16. Again, in chapter 7, the promises given to David. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him. As I took it away from Saul when I removed him from before you, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So now in Psalm 89, the psalmist again repeats those promises. Listen to verse 28 and 29 of Psalm 89. My loving kindness, I will keep him forever and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. I will establish his descendants forever and his throne as the days of heaven. So what's happened real quick? Again, the psalm begins with praise and then he shifts to and he just repeats the promises of God. 
because he's laying the foundation for the charge that he's about to bring. He's just saying, God, you said all this stuff. Now, you may be thinking, yeah, 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 but but you guys have sinned. You guys have missed the promises because you've sinned. But the psalmist doesn't miss that point because in verses 30 through 36, he reminds God of the fact that even if the Davidic king sins, you've promised Okay, look at verses 30 through 36. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with the rod and with their iniquity, with stripes. But I will not break off my loving kindness from him, nor deal falsely in in my faithfulness. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His descendants shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. Okay, did you follow all of that? So the psalmist spends this entire time taking very important promises that are given in the past. Okay, scripture And he's laying the foundation for his argument. Okay, now we're going to get to his argument because it's coming. But I want you to pause and I want you to notice this very important point. I want you to notice the way that the psalmist is holding on to the promises of God. How seriously he takes God's word. He trusts it. He believes it. Okay, God, you said, and then he prays God's word back to him. This is an absolute model of prayer. It is the best model of prayer for you to pray God's promises back to God. God, you said. God, you said if I cast all my anxiety upon you, that you will give me peace. A peace that surpasses my understanding and my circumstances. God, you said that if I ask for wisdom, that you would give it to me without reproof. You would give me wisdom for my circumstance. God, you said that whatever circumstances I walk through, that you will cause them all to work out for my good and to make me look more like Jesus. God, you said that you are holding on to me, that I'm not holding on to you, that you began this work in me and you will complete it all the way until the end. God, you said that if I would delight in you, and make you the treasure of my heart, that I would be able to taste and see more of you than I could ever imagine. God, you said. Why does God want us to pray this way? Because it's a relationship type of prayer. It's saying, God, I trust you. And I know what you've said and I believe it. And I'm coming to you as your son or as your daughter. I am coming to you because your word has begged me to come to you. Your word pleads with me to, and I'm coming. I am taking you at your word. Beloved, this is how you and I are called to focus our fight. Listen, when we're going through trials and when we're in the midst of suffering, we are tempted to feel sorry for ourselves. Amen? Okay, to become defeated, to spend all of our energy in self-loathing. Woe is me. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I guess I'll go eat worms. But the psalmist here shows us how to focus our fight Take aim at your downcast spirit by praying the promises of God back to him. All right, now pick back up at the third section of the psalm. 
What have the movements been? The first movement is the psalmist begins with praise. The second movement, the psalmist quoted multiple promises to David about that his kingdom would endure. It was a forever kingdom, okay? And, and that even if they disobeyed, that God would be faithful to them, that he would not forsake them. And now, look at verse 38. The psalmist gets real. He gets raw. But you have cast off and rejected. You have been full of wrath against your anointed. You have spurned the covenant of your servant. And you have profaned his crown in the dust. Look at verse 42. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You have made his enemies rejoice. Verse 45b. You have covered him with shame. And then there's two questions. Verse 46. How long, O Lord? Will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? How long? Verse 49. Where are your former loving kindnesses, O Lord, which you swore to David in your faithfulness? And then the psalm ends. And book three closes with those two looming questions. How long, O Lord? When will you turn and give your loving kindness as you promised? It just sits there with those questions. Notice the freedom to be confused. Raw and wrestle with God. The psalmist says, God, from my vantage point, I can't see it. I can read in your word. I can read your promises. I take you at your word. But when I look out, I don't see it one bit. You hear how raw he's been? Now, some of you are afraid to speak to God this way. Can I plead with you for a second? You already have these emotions. You already have these questions in your heart. And God already knows them. What's the point in hiding? What's the point in hiding? He already sees it. And hear me, his shoulders are broad enough to handle your darkest, deepest questions. Okay? Take note from the psalmist on how he is responding to God. He's not holding back at all. I rather think this sort of wrestling is like Jacob's, and it receives a blessing from the Lord. Now, catch this. Sadly, the psalmist, this is as far as he could see. He's sitting in exile, okay? Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. The Davidic king and his entire line slaughtered. From his vantage point, when he looks back at the promises of God, In 2 Samuel 7, you promised David a forever kingdom. His mind can only comprehend a succession of Davidic kings that last forever. He has no idea there's coming a forever king. He can't conceive of that. 
All he can think of, God, you said David's line will last forever, so that must mean a succession of Davidic kings. He doesn't know. He doesn't know there's coming a Davidic king. When he plays out the promises of the Son of God, and he traces that title, and he says, you called Israel your firstborn son. And then you said to the Davidic king that he would be an special, he's the anointed, the Messiah, he's the anointed special son of God, that he would rule and he would reign, that he would be a representative of your reign, God, as the son of God in his mind. That's the top of the ladder. He doesn't realize, okay, he thinks Israel left son of God and Davidic king as son of God. That's as high as it could go. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. There's coming a son of God who is the eternal king. Who reigns eternally. That is from eternity past and into eternity future. He doesn't know. He doesn't know the promises that are coming. So he sits in exile. He's downcast. He's overburdened. He looks around. He says, God, where are your promises? I don't see them. What should he do? Should he cast off all the promises? Should he say, that's not true? There's no way that could be. But you and I, we read. We sit from a different vantage point. And we want to we wanna come to him and we want to lift his head. And we want to say, no, no, no. There is a coming king. There's a com- The promises are greater than you could ever imagine. Don't you give up on the promises. Listen, the promises, they don't make sense right now. You can't see them. But listen, God is faithful. There is a coming king. There is a coming one. You don't understand, psalmist. Listen to me. This coming one, he is greater than you could ever imagine. He is from eternity past into eternity future. He is from the line of David. And and when he comes, listen to me, he will bear the weight of our sins. He will bring an eternal kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. He will restore our relationship to God the Father. He will span the chasm of separation of our sin. He will take it upon himself. He will bring restoration and redemption to you. He will come and give the indwelling Holy Spirit. God will no longer dwell in a temple, but he will now indwell you, believer. He will indwell us, and we will have a heart of stone taken out and we will be given a heart of flesh and the promises of God will unfold so that when we gather together on a Sunday morning like this, we are the temple of God. We know God. We worship him. The promises are greater than you could ever imagine, right? You just want to scream to the psalmist, hold on. Don't you give up on the promises of God. I know you can't see them. But there's so much better, so much deeper, so much richer. He is faithful. He's faithful. And if we would say that to the psalmist who is, Jerusalem's been destroyed, the temple's been destroyed, the Davidic line's been destroyed, and he's carried off into exile. How much more would we say that to you? As you sit in your suffering, in your sorrow, in your circumstances. Now, wait a second, listen. God is faithful. His promises are true. Don't you give up on his promises. They're true. Psalm 89 is a very special psalm for me personally because of the way that God used it in in mine and Lane's life. 
And so I'm gonna share with you a personal story. Uh, by the way, when I show these pictures, uh, oftentimes I get, who's that next to, obviously that's Lane, but who's that guy? It was me with hair. I need to give a caveat real quick before I share with you uh, this story. One, uh, my story is not an exegesis of the text. It's a personal story of faith about how God used this text. I've already given you the exegesis of the text. Uh, Number two, just because God worked out promises a certain way in my life does not mean that God always works promises out this exact same way. And number three, I'm going to be sharing a story with you about Ian's adoption. That is not in any way to undermine the difficulty uh, that Ian's birth mom and the decision that she had in order uh, to give him up for adoption. It was the most courageous thing uh, that she ever did, okay? But as many of you know, uh, about 12 years ago, Lane and I had struggled with infertility. We had been married for seven years. We had wanted kids. Um, We were unable to have kids. And at that point in our lives, this became the biggest struggle of our lives, the longest, darkest trial that we had to walk through. We had a lot of emotions to walk through. Primarily, we desired kids. Kids are a good thing. but we had unexplained infertility. And we had to wait, and as all of our friends and neighbors and everyone else was getting pregnant, we we had to sit and wait. We desired to adopt, uh, but because the Lord had called Lane and I into ministry, I was in seminary and we didn't have money. And whether you know it, adoption's expensive. And so we didn't have money to do so. And all we could do was sit and wait Well, when I got my first uh, ministry job and was done with seminary, we began our adoption process uh, only to be told in in the fall of 2009, uh, as we emptied our bank account, $5,000 is all I had to my name to begin the adoption process, uh, we were told that it would be two and a half years before we would have a child. Uh, And so this was a very dark moment for Elaine and I simply because we had already waited so long. I remember driving back to the house and my wife just saying to me, why can't it ever be easy? Why does it always have to be difficult? Well, little did we know at that moment that in the next ensuing weeks, we would be gifted an anonymous donation for $10,000 to complete our adoption And we would find out a friend of the family was pregnant and she had chosen us to be uh, the birth parents or or the uh, adoptive parents. And so with just with just in months, uh, we would have a child. It was an awesome situation uh, where it we could see the hand of the Lord working and moving in rapid succession. Let me tell you, as a husband, (coughs) My only prayer was for my wife's heart to be protected. We had already gone through so much, and I didn't want to selfishly pray, Lord, let this be my child. It was simply this, God, if this is the child that you have for us, would you please continue to open doors? But if it's not, could you please spare us the heartache of it not being our child? That was it. That was my only prayer as a husband, wanting to protect her. Well, the doors continued to fly open, and we had an incredible relationship with this friend of the family. We, we were supposed to be there at, uh, at Ian's birth, but suddenly as time grew closer to the time, uh, distance began to ensue and less phone calls and conversations, and suddenly it seemed like we were getting the cold shoulder. It was a Wednesday morning, and in my quiet time, I read Psalm 89, okay? And it's one of those times where you read your Bible, and and the Holy Spirit just makes you come alive, 
Like just what I've recounted here, where you read it and you're like screaming to the psalmist, hold on, God is faithful. You can't see it, but God's promises are true. And I just had this incredible moment of reading Psalm 89, seeing it for the first time, just becoming alive with with the way that the Holy Spirit interacted with me in the text. It was that same day that we got a phone call that Ian had been born. We were supposed to be there at the hospital, and then suddenly he's born. You may not know adoption rules in the state of Texas is is the mother cannot sign rights away for 48 hours. And so no matter what, you have to wait two days from birth before the mother can sign. And so we had no contact for those 48 hours, and you can imagine the thoughts that begin to swirl around in her mind. And then Friday morning, we got a phone call that she's keeping the baby. Nothing made sense at that moment. The one thing I had prayed to not happen. Wasn't trying to pray selfishly. I was just like, God, please don't let this happen. It happened. It wasn't the suffering that I was particularly going through. What what made it so hard is I, I couldn't protect my wife. And if I'm honest, the deepest hurt was God, I was pretty sure I saw your hand moving. What? And the Holy Spirit continued to remind me of Psalm 89. As if he had given me that text that day. Remember the psalmist? He couldn't see straight. He couldn't see how any of this is going to work out. And you screamed. You preached the gospel to him. You said, God is faithful. His promises are true. Even if he can't see it, he is faithful. And the spirit would just lift my head. Just lift my head. Those are probably the four longest days of my life, especially up to that point for Lane and I. Now, you know the end of the story. Uh, Ian's going to be here in the second service. And again, what what the mother had to go through, she she took Ian home for four days, but ultimately knew that, that the greatest loving thing that she could do for her son was to give him up for adoption and for Lane and I, we, we knew that, that he was our gift from God. Amen. And then on top of that, three months later, she gets pregnant. And now we have two biological children. All, all in God's timing, right? <clears throat> but here's what I want you to hear. Because I want you to go back. Put yourself in my shoes for those four days, and I want you to hear my testimony. It's hard to describe that in a situation where your world is crumbling and things don't make a lick of sense, that God gives peace. And he's closer than a brother. And he holds your heart in such a way. I mean, if you ask me and you say, Jason, why do you preach the way that you do? Why are you hoarse by, by yelling and getting into it? It is, it is moments like these where I stand before you and I just give testimony and I tell you, listen to me, God is faithful Amen. and he is good. And he is greater than your circumstances. And his promises are true, even if you can't see how they're going to work out. 
You can trust him. You can trust him. You should be like the psalmist. You should begin with praise. You should pray his promises back to him. And you should remember, there is a coming king. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. God, help us to be filled with faith, resting in your character, in who you are, that you are faithful, and that we can see the confusion of the psalmist, but we know the promises. And we can preach the hope of the good news of Jesus Christ. God, help us to be filled with that constant assurance that you are a rewarder of those who trust in you. We trust in you. We trust in you. You've given your son for us. We trust in you. Father, if there is anyone here that does not know you, God, I pray right now that they would trust in you. Father, if there is anyone here who's in the darkness of their suffering and trial and cannot see, all they can see is the darkness. God, I pray that you would give them a light and that light would be your character and that light would be your son that your promises are greater still, that you are an overcomer, that he who did not withhold his one and only son, but gave him up for us, will give us all things for your glory. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.